Welcome back to a Munchausen's Proxy, where we recently consigned Disney Marvel's Marvel Cinematic Universe to the dustbin of history. But does it have to be that way? Of course not. However, the likelihood of Bob Iger, Kevin Feige, and the rest of the crew at Disney Marvel changing course and actually doing what needs to be done to save it is slim. They do, however, have the perfect excuse for it in not only the Writers Guild of America strike, meaning they could chuck the activist writers killing their golden geese over the side by declaring force majeure on their contracts, but in the actor strike that promises to bring Hollyweird to a grinding halt in the middle of an economy that is teetering on the brink. It is the activist writers, actors, and directors who have brought all of Hollywood to a place they are currently wallowing. Well, them and the studio heads and board members who have allowed it to happen because they both don't seem to watch their own product and are too afraid to fire people destroying their billion dollar IPs. Nobody on the board of Disney should be happy with the management of Marvel or Star Wars or Pixar or Terminator now that they own 20th Century Studios. Just as nobody on the board of Paramount should be happy with the management of Star Trek, or the people on the board of Vivendi should be happy with the Alien franchise. Ultimately, the fault lies with the people who oversee the studios. If they care about actually making money off of their cash cows, their franchises, they would put a stop to the vandalization of the intellectual properties and the alienation of the fan bases. Since both continue, they either don't care or what is going on is what they want to go on. There's no other answer to the current equation in Hollywood. Unless you want to believe that Hollywood... The place the movie industry was born has suddenly become completely and totally incompetent. Yeah, I don't think so either. But I digress. If Marvel is savable, how does it happen? Well, I will ignore the mechanics of general staffing, finance, and overall management. That is for someone with better understanding than myself of the current and former workings of Hollywood Studios to discuss. Instead, I will stick with the creative decisions that have led to where we are today with the MCU, a franchise that used to print money for Disney, but now seems stuck tripping over its own feet because the people in charge have tied their own shoelaces together. I laid out my case for that in the previous Disney Marvel video. If you have not seen that one, pause this one and go watch that one. It is in the description below. The first thing that has to be done is fire everyone currently on staff at Marvel Comics who has any input into the creative process. Whether that be the artists, the writers, the editors, everyone has to go. And the people who hired them. Yes, everyone. Marvel Comics is where most of the terrible ideas Marvel Studios is currently working with came from. The storytelling and the artwork in most of the comics I have seen from Marvel Comics in recent years is terrible. The comics division of Marvel is even more infiltrated and bloated with talentless activist hacks than Marvel Studios and Disney overall, and has been since at least the very early 2010s. The American comic industry is a desolate wasteland of creativity, where it used to be the wellspring from which Hollywood got some of its more lucrative ideas. Japanese and Korean manga are dominating the industry because both Marvel and DC have managed to completely bugger themselves. There is no character that cannot be resurrected through the multiverse. There is no timeline that cannot be quote-unquote fixed. There is no character that cannot be changed to fit a, quote, modern audience, unquote. There is no continuity that cannot be retconned. No matter how many times they wind up screwing up the entire comic universe in which their characters play, and no matter how many of those characters are destroyed, 
And unlike American comics, one of the reasons manga is beating their American counterparts is because there is an integrated continuity between many of the most popular books, shows, and movies. The books sell the shows and movies, and vice versa. There is no such relationship between the comics and shows and movies Marvel and DC put out. As a matter of fact, in actuality there is a countervailing relationship between the two. Marvel puts out a billion dollar movie and kids go to the comic shop to buy a Captain America or Iron Man comic. And what do they see? Captain Falcon and Ironheart. Instead of Thor, they get Lady Thor. Miss Marvel has a new movie coming out, and what does Marvel Comics do just months out from its release date? They kill off the character. Not in her comic book, because nobody reads that trash, but in Spider-Man, so people actually see it. It is similar, though not nearly as bad, on the DC side. So you first have to fix Marvel Comics, and that is Disney's responsibility since they own them. Find a Graham Nolan type or similar for Marvel and give him control, total control, to put Marvel back in a place where it is a fountain of creative ideas and profitable books once more. Make it so the continuity is not constantly being changed, the stakes in the stories not constantly being undermined by stupid contrivances like multiverse variants and time travel and retcons. The established characters not altered to fit the activist hack's vision or self-image. And make it so the comics division is not doing things that go against what the shows and films are doing. And for the sake of all that's holy, start cross-advertising between the comics and the movies and the shows. That, however, is just a background step. Something that needed doing years ago in order to fix the pipeline of ideas coming from the comics onto the small and big screens. For some reason, Disney is content to let the comics division wither and die while also bringing the ideas that are killing them to their shows and movies. The next step is harder. Fire Kevin Feige. Not just fire Kevin Feige, fire Kevin Feige and all of his minions. I'm sorry, but the man has to go. He said, I believe it was before the opening of Avengers Endgame, that he intended to make sure there were more diverse heroes in the MCU going forward. That there would be more female heroes than male. Now, if done organically and with a plan and purpose beyond political pandering, there might be nothing wrong with a more diverse cast of characters in the MCU. But that is not what happened, and it was a signal that the MCU was about to go downhill. Now, the signs were there before Endgame. Ant-Man was sidelined in his own sequel for Wasp and the tragic villain Ghost. And Captain Marvel should have been called Captain Mary Sue, starring Plank of Wood. Then there was the scene in Endgame that was mandated on high from Disney Marvel. If you have seen it, then you know what I'm talking about without me even describing it. Not even the target audience that scene was aimed at liked it, seeing it as the worst form of pandering. The number of bad decisions Kevin Feige has made are legion by this point. And just firing him won't do anything, much like just firing Kathleen Kennedy at Lucasfilm won't save that division of Disney. It is a step in the right direction, but both Feige and Kennedy have permeated their studios with their lackeys, minions, and confederates. They must all go if the ship is to be righted. Otherwise, you risk infighting between pro-Feige and pro-new management people. In Feige's place needs to go someone who both knows the source material pre-2010 and that there has to be a plan, but that the plan can't be so rigid, copious, and expansive in time that there is no room for adjustment. The recently fired Ike Perlmutter, for instance, who was in charge of Marvel before Feige pulled off a palace coup on him. Phase 4 of the MCU was flaming out at its inception, with movies no fan was interested in seeing, never mind the normies. However, no one at Marvel could or would change course. 
Throwing good money after bad as each film came forth to lackluster reception and or box office numbers. Not only that, there was clearly no plan behind the phase overall. Each of the first three phases was building to Infinity War and Endgame. They were three phases into the experiment that was the Marvel Cinematic Universe and had no idea where to go after Endgame. But they had a mission. Diversity and inclusion. After all, Kevin Feige already laid down the mandate that the MCU would have more female heroes than male. While this completely went counter to the reason Disney bought Marvel, and Star Wars for that matter, namely because they wanted into the boys' entertainment and toy markets and couldn't think of a way to do it in-house, the political and social bent of those in the company could not help but obscure the original corporate thinking. And so more female heroes were brought forward in a manner that was anything but organic. The same thing with more minority characters. This is not to say such characters would not sell. If done properly, they would. However, the manner in which it was done in Phase 4 was much like that girl power scene in Endgame. Even the female and minority parts of the audience saw it for what it was. Namely, pandering. It did not help that the writing was pretty mediocre, some of the acting was less than ideal to show off new characters, and the overall execution produced movies and shows that were forgettable or worse like the Eternals. It also did not help that Marvel overhyped the political social aspects of their purpose in making the films in the media campaigns leading up to the releases. With statements like, it's life-saving. Yes, they honestly allowed words like that to come out of their mouths when promoting a superhero movie. And it was all done while deconstructing fan-favorite characters like Falcon, Captain America, Hawkeye, Black Widow, Thor, Loki, and the Hulk, mostly through Disney Plus shows that were anywhere from meh to execrable, and movies meant to elevate new characters by bringing down old, usually white and usually male, characters. So the next head of Marvel needs to rein in the activists and remember that they are trying to get the largest audience as is humanly possible to go see their movies or subscribe to their streaming service. Alienating a large chunk of that potential pool of customers by inserting political and social messaging they find contrary to their own ideals and beliefs is counterproductive. They also need to remember this is supposed to be entertainment. They are superhero movies and shows. They are not saving lives. What they are is the male side of Disney entertainment. The females get the princess movies, and nobody objects over much to that. Unless you start race swapping in such a moronic way as to tank that side of your operation too. See the live action Little Mermaid for details. The boys and men are supposed to get the superheroes and space wizards. Keep that in mind when you make your superhero and space wizard movies, because that is your target audience. If you can get the girls and women to come to your flick as well, gravy. But you don't do it in such a way as to repel, actively repel, the boys and men. See Disney Star Wars for details. And through three phases, Marvel knew how to do that, largely by having the buff superheroes take their shirts off gratuitously. If you think I am wrong, see the Aquaman box office numbers for details. It was a mediocre movie boosted to the stratosphere on the abs of Jason Momoa and the rockin' body of Amber Heard. Not great acting or writing. The next step might be even harder than the second to get through to the top brass. Stop weaving the shows on Disney Plus into the overall main storyline of the MCU. I know Bob Iger and the board of Disney will hate this, but it has to be done. If you are going to have Marvel shows on Disney Plus, they have to be more like ABC's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. What I mean by that 
is they can acknowledge and build on things that happen in the movies, but they can't be so integral to the overall storyline that if you miss a show, you are lost watching the movies. The Marvel stands watch everything, but they are a tiny portion of your audience. The Marvel fan base, if the shows were good and the movies still worth paying for, is a little bigger than the stands and amplify media reach to promote the shows and films for free when they are good. However, you need to remember that the largest portion of the audience are normies. Normies only go to see something if it is getting good word of mouth or they like the marketing. They will not watch everything. Meaning a Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness can be a little confusing to the normie because it is built on the back of the WandaVision and Loki shows rather than the last Doctor Strange movie or even Spider-Man No Way Home. A little over a million people watched WandaVision and a little over two million watched Loki. That is not nearly enough to support a movie with a budget Marvel is splurging on films these days. The only reason Doctor Strange 2 did as well as it did at the box office is because the normies thought it was going to be a sequel to Spider-Man No Way Home. And the record second week drop-off at the box office proved that. No, the stories for the shows have to be their own thing, not interwoven so integrally to the storyline of the MCU movies. Have them acknowledge events and build on them, but don't make it required viewing in order to understand what the hell is going on in the newest Marvel movie. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. did this to good effect for seven or eight seasons. You can even promote your next movie with the shows by having characters from the movies as guest stars for an episode or two, but for a completely different possibly tangential but not vital reason related to the next movie. The shows would also be a good way to flesh out the cast of potential characters for the movies if you are still upset there are too many straight white male characters. But stop trying to incorporate the crap from Marvel Now, All New All Different Marvel, and later from the comics. That is the sewage that is sinking Marvel Comics. Why would you want to use it and do the same with Marvel Studios as you have been? Also, fire the writers and stop hiring people like them. Get people who know comic books pre-2010. Jessica Gao and her team destroyed She-Hulk. Miss Marvel was never going to work because she is nothing but a self-insert by Sanma Aminat. Moon Knight was a bait-and-switch job so they could have their overpowered female hero replacement save him. Hawkeye was a deconstruction of Hawkeye and a bait-and-switch for Kate Bishop. And on and on. This is killing your target audience while not attracting the audience you think is out there for that slop. Twitter is not the real world. The stories should be smaller, storylines self-contained, and the characters vibrant and engaging. And no CGI Skybeam messes. That is what turned a quirky, interesting concept like WandaVision into a mess by the end of the series. The next step is also not going to be popular with the board of directors. Stop. Just stop. You have tanked this version of the MCU. The popular actors either quit or are aged out of the roles, and the new ones are not clicking. So stop. It is time for this version of the MCU to end. I know I titled this How to Save the MCU, but there is little you can do to salvage the current iteration. We are over a decade and a half and 30 movies into this, with the last half dozen or so being utterly useless exercises in character and universe destruction. Unless you want to do a Marvel Comics style retcon, which probably would not work anyway, it is time to start the whole project over. It should have been done after Endgame, especially since there was little to no acknowledgement of the absolute catastrophe the blip would have been 
beyond Spider-Man No Way Home and the plotline of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which was another D-plus show that sucked. Wait at least five years to start recasting any of the characters already in the MCU. Hold on, I'm not done. This does not mean you stop making Marvel movies for five years. But the Avengers and all the rest of the current lineup has to stop. If you do not, the end of the comic book movie era will wipe you out anyway. Also, stop making three or four movies plus four or five shows a year. It is too much. Two movies a year tops, with maybe another three shows to go with them tops, and immediately cancel any that are not working. Stop paying for crap movies and streaming shows and stop renewing crap streaming shows. The reason the Western genre died was partly due to the oversaturation of mediocre to bad Western movies and shows dragging down the really good ones. For a really good video on that, check out Razorfist's summation of the importance and death of the Western movie genre, which I will link in the description. Too many comic book projects also put normies in a daze as to what to see. With Marvel's glut of projects added to the crap DC puts out, the market has more supply than demand is asking for. So stop. Go figure out how to do the things you used to do before the MCU came along. Like fixing whatever has gone terribly, terribly wrong in your animation department. Especially Pixar. Here's a hint. It's partly the same thing wrong with Marvel. Rediscover the action genre and the mid-budget movie. Not everything has to be a $200 million superhero movie CGI'd to the hilt. But if I'm suggesting a complete stop on the current character lineup and slowing down of productions overall, what is left for Marvel to do, you might ask? This is actually a lot easier than you might think. Marvel Comics has been around for over eight decades. In those decades, they have published nearly every genre of story imaginable. Why has Disney Marvel only ever done straight-up superhero films? I would suggest diversifying the character and story portfolio while still leaving it open for other genre characters to make it into the larger MCU. For example, Marvel has a horror subsection to their catalog that includes classic characters like Dracula and created characters like Mephisto, as well as more modern characters like Blade and the various iterations of Ghost Rider. Take them seriously, Disney Marvel, and start a lower-budget horror line of Marvel movies, preferably with an R rating. I was never too into that side of Marvel, but I would start with a vampire-related movie that could lead into a Blade movie. That would be two movies on the docket right there. And no, I am not taking the Blade movie currently entering production hell at Disney Marvel seriously. For one thing, Blade is and has always been a rated R character. That Disney Marvel is trying to PG-13 him is ridiculous. For another... They are turning that movie into the by now standard Disney bait and switch by including Blade's daughter, one of the more recent characters from Marvel. A little side rant before I move on. None of the bait and switch characters has worked, but Disney keeps trying with both Marvel and Star Wars. In case you were unaware of what I am talking about, Marvel and Star Wars name a show after a character people generally have really good feelings about. Say, for instance, Hawkeye and Obi-Wan Kenobi. They are not the only ones, but they are easy shows to use as an example. They announce the show and make a big production of having the actor who has played the role pimp it to the public as if he is actually the star of the show. Then it airs, and the entire show is geared toward making a female character the center of the story while also deconstructing the classic male character. Stop it. 
If you cannot write female characters in a positive light without tearing down the male characters, just stop. Your show slash movie will suck and piss off fans. Uh, see Lucasfilm's entire library since 2018? Not even the female side of the audience likes those shows. It is a leading cause of Disney Plus's failure on the Marvel and Star Wars side of things. Never mind the abomination that was the Willow series. Back to diversification. There is also an entire subgenre that could be called mythology. Journey into Mystery started as a horror comic and switched to monsters and characters like Thor and Loki. It is where we first see Thor as a character in the comics. Given the current popularity of movies like Godzilla and King Kong, this would be an avenue Marvel could take for interesting movies that skirt their superhero-focused MCU. It is a subgenre filled with monsters like Jormungandr, also known as the Midgard Serpent, as well as trolls, frost, fire, and mountain giants, and gods from Norse and other mythologies. It would also be an excellent opportunity to tell fascinating stories from the mythologies of other cultures outside of Europe. And while it would still be a Marvel movie, the characters therein would only tangentially be connected to the main MCU, with possible exceptions like Thor or Loki or Hercules or Sunfire. Another subgenre of Marvel that is a currently untapped wellspring of stories is the detective side of Marvel. And such films would not be money pits like the special effects driven superhero films. Characters like Jessica Jones have already been explored by the Netflix series, but there are others in the subgenre who are not quite as superpowered as Jessica Drew or Luke Cage. Movies like this would be sub $100 million budget movies that could turn tidy profits if done well. In with this detective group, you would also add characters similar to Black Widow in spy thrillers. It was a mistake to turn the Black Widow movie into a special effects laden mess the way Marvel did. Made into a spy thriller, it would have been cheaper and had a tighter script that told an intriguing espionage tale befitting Black Widow. Other characters in Marvel fall into this category of untapped potential, including at times in his past, Wolverine. Then there is the martial arts subgenre that Marvel overall has largely neglected since the early 1980s. Characters like Shang-Chi, Iron Fist, Power Man, also known as Luke Cage, Wolverine, and various others, and their antagonists, were flourishing in the 70s. Many of them have been disowned in recent time because of, quote, problematic, unquote, pasts. But they are characters whose stories would make good movies if, again, you keep the budgets low, the ratings are, and keep the CGI special effects largely out of them. The problem with the movie Wolverine was partly, but not totally, that Wolverine is not a character you can do well at the PG-13 rating, as the movie Logan showed. Some of the other martial arts Marvel characters are similar, but most you could probably keep at the PG-13 rating and make a good movie, as long as it does not wander into becoming a CGI mess like Shang-Chi did. With Disney completely screwing the pooch on Star Wars, and Paramount f***ing up the only other major science fiction space franchise in Star Trek, I would have Marvel venture into the space opera genre, with a movie based on the war between either the Kree and Skrulls, or the Skrulls and the Zandarians, probably from the perspective of Novacor in the case of the latter, possibly showing the destruction of Xandar. Another possibility would be a movie depicting the coup of Deathbird against her sister Empress Liliandra, introducing both the Starjammers and Liliandra's relationship with Charles Xavier. For a more sci-fi horror angle, a film involving the Brood coming to Earth and encountering the X-Men would be great, but it doesn't have to be the X-Men. This happened in the comics more than once, and the brood, an alien species that infect other species who then become brood, 
had an especially memorable encounter with the X-Men in the late 1980s. They are like an organic version of the Borg from Star Trek, including being ruled by a queen and having a hive mind. The Brood were unable to successfully infect Wolverine, and he helped destroy the Brood invasion of Earth and save the other X-Men. Those three science fiction movies would be what I would choose to start with on the space opera and science fiction horror side. My personal choice would be to start with a Novacore movie in the context of the war between the Skrulls and the Zandarians. If that is successful, the others can be greenlit, starting with a brood movie not necessarily set on Earth. An interesting storyline for that one would be the Shi'ar interaction with the brood. And finally, the superheroes. I said earlier that Disney Marvel needs to stop their current lineup and recast, but not putting anything with those characters out for, at the very least, five years. More would be better. And yes, that means recasting everyone. That does not mean they have to abandon the genre entirely. One of the glaring mistakes of the MCU post-Endgame was not using the blip to explain mutants so recently acquired from 20th Century Fox. It would have been an easy way to explain the sudden proliferation of mutants into the MCU who were completely missing before this. You wouldn't have all of the mutants due to the blip, but the sudden emergence of them could be explained by it. I think part of it is that Marvel had been trying to suppress the popularity of mutant characters and shift to Inhumans because they did not own the rights for the mutants for so many years. They used the Inhumans on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to good effect. When the Inhumans miniseries performed so poorly, that plan was out the window and they were stuck until they acquired the mutants from Fox. Miss Marvel was an inhuman in the comics, and they changed her to a mutant for her Disney Plus show recently, probably in reaction to the general lack of interest in inhumans by the audience. One of the first projects I would start up would be the X-Men. The current leaks out of Disney Marvel seem to indicate they are going to race and sex swap the hell out of the X-Men when they cast those characters. This is a mistake. The X-Men are already fairly diverse once you get past the original four X-Men. If you have a problem with white people, especially white men, being in movies, and you can't get past your racism and sexism, skip the origin tale and move right into giant X-Men number one. In that story, the original X-Men have disappeared on a mission and are thought to be dead while investigating the island of Krakoa. In order to finish the mission and hopefully rescue the first group of X-Men, Professor Xavier recruits Nightcrawler in Germany, Wolverine in Canada, the Irishman Banshee on tour in Tennessee, Storm from Kenya in Egypt, Colossus in Russia, and Thunderbird from the Apache lands in Arizona as the new X-Men. Along with Colossus, you would also get his sister Ilyana, who would go on to be in the New Mutants and become the powerful Sorcerer's Magic. Banshee eventually has a daughter named Siren with similar powers to his and becomes an X-Men member. Thunderbird's brother Warpath has similar powers and later joins the X-Men. This would make an excellent introduction of the X-Men and mutants into the MCU. If that is not enough female characters for you, I suppose you could add Shadowcat, the British version of Psylocke, the story of how she became Japanese is too good not to do a movie about it, or Dazzler. You could add Rogue as a villain who comes around to join the X-Men, if you must, but that is also a good story that would make a good movie to introduce the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. From that first movie, you set up the X-Men as their own little sub-universe that is in the MCU, but they and the Avengers or any other group should not meet until you have set up enough stories to have them meet in an Avengers vs. X-Men movie seven or eight years down the line at the very least. Do not rush things like DC did with the Justice League movie. Also, do not shy away from killing the character that dies in Giant X-Men number one. Another part of the MCU that was a problem was nobody died. 
so there were few consequences to the stories for the characters. Until Infinity War and Endgame, there was not a single significant character death in the MCU, so the audience knew there was no real peril or stakes for their favorite characters. This is one of the things that made Game of Thrones such a massive cultural phenomenon. You never knew if or when your favorite character, or favorite character to hate, was going to get whacked. The first X-Men movie will show that has changed with the new MCU right out of the gate. Another opening project for your new MCU should be the origin story of the Fantastic Four. Yes, they did that with Jessica Alba and Ian Gruffudd in the early 2000s, but it had issues. And don't even get me started on that abomination with Miles Teller, Kate Mara, and Michael B. Jordan in the mid-2010s. This should come straight out of the comics with no deviation, and the casting has to be spot on. Thus far, I am not overly thrilled with the leaks coming out of where Disney Marvel are headed with their planned movie. They are not great choices for the guys. Adam Driver is a good actor, but I'm prejudiced against him because he was in all three of those crapfest Star Wars movies as a tantrum-throwing psycho. Oh, and he does not strike me as a good read. The guy rumored to be up for playing Johnny Storm, I have never seen in anything to my recollection. He may be good. He may not. And David Diggs, I have only known from his starring role in the race-swapped Snowpiercer show on TNT. I did not watch the show, but he would once again be cast in a race-swapped role. Given Ben Grimm would be turned into a rocky monster in fairly short order, it matters a little less. As long as he has the acting chops to do a heavy New York accent without sounding clownish. Margot Robbie would be a good Susan Storm if the rumors about her casting are true. However, a Fantastic Four movie will live or die on Doctor Doom casting, and I haven't heard anything about that character as of yet. Not to mention some or all of those rumored castings could go out the window because Disney Marvel is trying to negotiate the salaries to them all downward. Even Disney eventually hits a wall in spending silly amounts of money on superhero movies. I would rather go with young, fairly unknown, but very good actors. It would keep the budget down and allow the actors to grow with the movies down the line. We are building an MCU for the long term, so established actors are too expensive and generally too old. This movie and the X-Men movie would also need a good writer, especially as an opening to a new MCU. The writers of the Phase 4, 5, and 6 movies have largely been terrible choices. I don't know why Disney Marvel is picking up Rick and Morty staff left and right but those are the ones doing the Avengers movies in Phase 6. People involved in the failed Disney Plus shows have also been picked to do Phase 5 and 6 projects. Disney Marvel have chosen the writer of Terminator Dark Fate and the Snowpiercer show to write the Fantastic Four movie, and I am not optimistic, especially as no cast has been announced. They are just leaking ideas and have been for a couple years now. I personally would prefer someone with less writing baggage than Terminator Dark Fate to write the Fantastic Four movie that I will launch my new MCU with, and a director with a longer film resume than a single movie that couldn't scrape $300,000 at the box office. I think the only reason he was chosen is because he directed all of WandaVision. And that is not a recommender for a movie whose budget will probably be in the 200 million plus range. No, I would be looking for someone of the caliber of the early directors of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. The Russo Brothers, Joss Whedon, Jon Favreau, Kenneth Branagh, Joe Johnston, or maybe some of my dream directors they probably have never approached, like Antoine Fuqua or Luc Besson. I would have especially liked to see Luc Besson do something like Guardians of the Galaxy, The Micronauts, or ROM, and stop allowing the writers and directors to make their own films parodies of themselves. A little humor is necessary from time to time, 
So much humor that you are stepping on emotional or important events in your movies is helping to kill them. If you are not taking your cinematic universe seriously, why should the audience? This is not the Orville or Rick and Morty or Spaceballs. Oh, and this first Fantastic Four movie should not have Doctor Doom as the main villain. Build up to Doom in a similar way that the MCU built up to Thanos. Use the Frightful Four or Inhumans as the first antagonist to get the franchise off the ground. Introduce in a second film the idea that Doctor Doom was behind the events of the first and have the Fantastic Four go up against a protege or minion of Doctor Doom before making the third movie a Fantastic Four vs. Doctor Doom story. I would also make both the X-Men movie and the Fantastic Four movie period pieces. They don't necessarily need to be set in the 1970s and 1960s respectively, but they should definitely not be set in current year. At least not the beginning scenes through their gaining powers in the Fantastic Four's case and saving the original X-Men in the X-Men's case. In the case of the Fantastic Four, having it set in an earlier decade would make their not shielding the rocket slash space station from solar flares more believable. From there, you can begin to bring the characters forward in time. Why? Two reasons. First, the X-Men were a quintessentially 60s and 70s group. Everything from their costumes to the themes being tackled in the books were of their time. The last thing you would want to do is to tempt the idiots at Disney Marvel into doing current year X-Men, which is completely retarded in every way, shape, and form. They have turned the X-Men into an ethnostate, the complete opposite of what Charles Xavier stood for throughout the run of X-Men until modern day writers caught up with him. Such an idea would more likely have come from the mind of Magneto and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. As a matter of fact, the X-Men are so f***ed up these days that the evil part has been dropped from the Brotherhood's name, despite it still being led by a Magneto that has only slightly modified his aims. So no, no modern X-Men. Not to mention many of the new characters that appear in the X-Men from about 2000 on have been ridiculous. And some of the old ones have been radically changed from their origins to fit, quote-unquote, a modern audience. Because the hacks writing for Marvel these days can't create new characters people want to read. Looking at you, Iceman, my poor dude. The second reason to make the first couple or few X-Men movies period pieces is to allow you to do very awesome crossover events as movies in the context of their time. I am thinking of events like The Mutant Massacre, Fall of the Mutants, Inferno, or Legion. All of these were massively popular, multi-issue crossover events that had lasting impact on the mutants and the overall Marvel Comics universe. In the first one, you had the Marauders, a band of evil mutants, massacre most of the mutant outcast group called the Morlocks, who lived in tunnels, subways, and sewers of New York City. The X-Men and X-Factor were involved separately, of course, but so were other characters like the New Mutants, Thor, Power Pack, and Daredevil, as they battled the Marauders as well. Fall of the Mutants had the X-Men very publicly sacrifice their lives in Dallas, Texas, in order to stop a demon called the Adversary, who was trying to destroy the world. All while a government agency of quote-unquote reformed villains who were the former members of the Brotherhood tries to arrest them for violating the Mutant Registration Act. Their sacrifice brings public opinion to the mutant side of the debate about the act. The X-Factor books had a different storyline and the New Mutants had their own storyline. Unlike the Mutant Massacre, the storylines were not interwoven. The result of the X-Men side of the events was the X-Men were given the ability to escape all surveillance and detection by the goddess Roma for their efforts and given the siege perilous that would allow them new lives should they ever be found in their new home in the Australian outback. The siege perilous is how Psylocke went from a pink-haired Brit to a black-haired Japanese woman eventually. These events all take place with a fair amount of time between them 
Making them period pieces in the movies rather than modern stories would allow for the time jumps and the actors aging in between films. Should you want to show what happens in between catastrophes, you could do X-Men specials for Disney+, Plus, but never make watching those necessary to watch the next movie. Also, to feed Disney+, Plus, you could restart the abandoned X-Men Origins idea, doing streaming movies or miniseries or shows about the origins of the various X-Men. Storm, Wolverine, Gambit, X-23, the Summers Brothers, Professor Xavier, Magneto, Bishop, Forge, Cable, Magic, Dazzler, Longshot, Nightcrawler, Mystique, and Rogue all have fascinating origins that would make interesting shows or miniseries, especially Wolverine, Storm, Rogue, Nightcrawler, and Cable. And again, make sure they are addendums to, and not integral to, the movies. Nothing shown in those Disney Plus offerings should wind up being homework to watch the next movies. For the Fantastic Four, you make the first movie a period piece for the simple reason that their origin happens when they are fairly young. Reed Richards and Ben Grimm were in their early to mid-30s, but Johnny Storm was a teen and his sister was in the first half of her 20s. Getting younger actors to make a period piece Fantastic Four origin movie would allow the actors to age up as the time passes in the movies. Comic book characters do not seem to age. Hollywood actors do. If comic book characters did age normally, all of the Fantastic Four, except for The Thing, would be well into their dotage by now. The Thing is, apparently, nigh immortal, as he doesn't age while not in human form. I was never a hardcore Fantastic Four reader, though I do have more than a few. So I'm not sure where to go with the Fantastic Four after the origin movie and its follow-ups. Their classic villains always seemed far larger in scope than most of those the X-Men tangled with, leading to world-shattering results if they failed. The Skrulls, Silver Surfer, Galactus, the Kree, Namor the Submariner, and of course, the previously mentioned Doctor Doom, were all either end-of-the-world villains or take-over-the-world villains. Instead of making Doctor Doom's origin similar to that of the Fantastic Four, as the 2005 movie did, the movie should either leave his origin a mystery or use the original comic version of his origin. It is a much more fascinating backstory than him being caught in the same solar storm the Fantastic Four were caught in. As a matter of fact, you could get a solo movie for him before he goes up against the Fantastic Four, with Doom as the protagonist, sort of like the 2014 Dracula Untold movie starring Luke Evans. Put it out shortly after the second movie as a lead-in to the third Fantastic Four movie that shows their conflict and give him a slight cameo at the very end, maybe an end credit scene, of the second Fantastic Four movie. Teasing him as the big bad, sort of like they did with Thanos in the Infinity Saga. From there, the sky is literally not the limit with the Fantastic Four. They are a group that is far more entwined with the cosmic side of Marvel Comics Universe than most of the other groups aside from the Guardians of the Galaxy. With their villains being whole interstellar species, cosmic entities, and demons from various hell dimensions, the topics for movies are only limited by the budget you want to spend and the creativity of your writers. Admittedly, that last one will be the chief problem in today's Hollywood. The X-Men would be a more terrestrial group, with stories that show the difficulties they have both living with humans and trying to save them from both themselves and the villainous mutants like Magneto. And like Doctor Doom, the first couple of X-Men movies should not feature Magneto. Get the saving of the X-Men movie out first, and then you can start introducing the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, Marauders, Reavers, maybe Apocalypse and other X-Men villains. Avoid like the plague anything in the comics after 2005. All new, all different Marvel and Marvel Now should be avoided at all costs. 
Until Marvel Comics is straightened out and back to routinely selling a few hundred thousand copies of the top 50 books each month, they are a wasteland of the creatively bankrupt who ruined the publisher. Oh, and one other thing before I move on from the X-Men and Fantastic Four. Stop making every movie end of the world. That works for two or three movies, and then people see the formula and stop caring. By the time Endgame came around, that process had started to run its course, which is one of the reasons why Phase 4 of the MCU was such a bust. Moviegoers had seen the formula too many times. And yes, it was a formula by that point. Directors of MCU movies had let leak that Disney Marvel already had the blueprint for their movie ready before the script was even done. They had worked out the action set pieces for them and there was no power in the director's hands that could change them, meaning the MCU movies had become cookie cutter and boring. The same could be said of the shows. After the third or fourth bait and switch show, Disney Plus viewers kind of got the idea and stopped wasting their time and money. The movies have to have stakes, yes. However, Not everything needs to be end-of-the-world skybeam CGI army schlock. End-of-the-world needs to be an event, like Infinity War and Endgame. Not every movie you put out. Thor was a personal journey movie for the titular character with no real larger-than-life stakes. Captain America Winter Soldier skirted that line and was one of the better MCU movies. Black Panther had stakes, but kept them reasonable. Spider-Man Homecoming had a modest villain with modest goals. You lead up to everything going to shit, not have going to shit be the formula. Which is a good place to transition into what to do with the ridiculous streaming service that needs feeding. Personally, I think Disney Marvel has completely buggered their MCU d lineup. They started off sort of interesting with WandaVision. It was quirky and played around with the character. However, that show went off the rails by the end, turning into a Skybeam CGI mess with idiotic storytelling and terrible dialogue and messaging. Loki, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Hawkeye, and the rest did no better, and in some cases, much worse by the end of Phase 4. Secret Invasion The start of Phase 5 on D+, is a deconstructing mess that has ruined one of the great leaders of the MCU in Nick Fury. So the MCU on Disney Plus also needs scrapping and reworking. As I mentioned earlier, nothing on Disney Plus should ever be required viewing to understand the movies shown in theaters. They can reference and build on events in the movies only. Since I started with the X-Men, let me throw out three ideas that would make interesting shows that could fill the mutant side of things for Disney Plus for a while. First, we are bringing Colossus into the X-Men. We should be bringing his sister Ilyana to the X-Mansion as a student as well. Ilyana is named Magic, and my second favorite mutant character ever. As a child, she was kidnapped by demons and taken to the Limbo Dimension, where she learned magic and her mutant ability to create teleportation portals, hence her name Magic, with a K. Magic, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, was the only good thing to come out of the crappy New Mutants movie, which was the last mutant movie made by Fox before Disney bought them. She is the leader of the New Mutants in the comics, the sort of junior version of the X-Men made up of some of the students at Professor Xavier's school who are too young to be X-Men. Their adventures come with the usual teenage conundrum of how to circumvent the adults who are trying to keep them safe while not getting into so much trouble that the adults would have to bail them out, literally or figuratively. The New Mutants would make an excellent teen drama in the mold of Buffy the Vampire Slater, The Vampire Diaries, or Wednesday, but with mutants. The stakes of their adventures rarely match the level of their senior counterparts in the X-Men, but there were stakes, especially in events like Fall of the Mutants and Inferno. Since they live in the X-Mansion, you could also have some of the characters from the X-Men drop in on the series from time to time. 
especially leading up to a new X-Men film. And when the actors age out of the roles, you have the option of graduating them to the movies or recasting them. Another lesser-known group was Power Pack. They were a group of four younger kids who got their powers from a dying alien who gave the four siblings of the Power family one of his powers each so they could defend their planet from the alien race known as Snarks. He also left them the intelligent spaceship Friday. The kids got powers such as gravity manipulation, super speed, mass manipulation, and energy manipulation. Like the New Mutants, Power Pack's adventures were much less consequential, although not inconsequential, than the X-Men's. They battled real enemies, but the comic also talked about issues real kids would encounter, like bullying, drugs, and child abuse. This would be a show aimed at an even younger audience than the New Mutants, since the Power Pack siblings ranged in age from 5 to 12. They occasionally crossed paths with other groups of characters, including the New Mutants and Fantastic Four, especially Reed Richards and Sue Storm's children, Franklin and Valeria. The third group I would make a series out of on the mutant side of things is the Exterminators. After the original X-Men left Krakoa, The new X-Men were using the name already, and members of the original X-Men were left at loose ends. Some of them joined other groups like the Defenders, not the Defenders from the Netflix show. The comic book Defenders was a pretty cool book that would also make a good show or movie. But eventually, all of the X-Men joined together as X-Factor. They posed as mutant hunters in the era building up to the Mutant Registration Act, but were really rescuing mutants in trouble to keep them from the government. Exterminators were a group of kids they rescued. Both X-Factor and Exterminators would make good series, but Exterminators would be aimed at the teen audience mostly and follow their attempts to blend into the private schools they have been sent to while also getting involved in adventures due to their powers and desire to use them for good. Since X-Factor eventually is dissolved and the members rejoin the X-Men, I would only use them for a short time, not nearly long enough to bother with a film unless it is a follow-on to an X-Men Follow the Mutants movie. X-Factor might make a good miniseries for D+, thereby explaining who the Exterminators are and setting up that series. And to go with the idea of diversification of programming for Marvel, The other genre shows should be pursued. In the horror category, I would like to see a Ghost Rider show set in the Old West in the vein of Pale Rider or similar elemental westerns that hinted at something supernatural going on. Ghost Rider would make a good subject for such a show and the CGI costs would be severely limited to those occasions when Carter Slade needs to use his powers. Another horror show that would be good would be an addendum to the vampire movie I mentioned earlier. Depending on whether Disney can get out of its own way and stop disnifying everything they do, the show would be aimed at either a teen or adult audience. If Disney is only interested in PG-13 shows, something in the vein of Joss Whedon's Angel would be interesting. Though I would set the show somewhere not Los Angeles or New York mostly to keep costs down, but also to set it somewhere unique and interesting that people don't usually get to see. Somewhere like Nashville, Tennessee, or Savannah, Georgia, or somewhere in Colorado other than Denver would be refreshing. If they could see past the Disneyfication of all they do, then I would skew the vampire show more towards the gothic horror side of the genre and aim it at adults in the vein of the original interview with the vampire film Underworld or the Russian film Nightwatch that kicked off an interesting trilogy of movies. I would also think about an anthology series or miniseries in the mythology genre that could introduce new characters who cannot carry a film or series but would be interesting for a single episode. Such characters, should they prove popular, could either be brought back for more one-off episodes or be introduced to other series and movies. On the detective-slash-espionage genre side of things, a series about Madripoor would be awesome. And with it comes the possibility of having characters like Wolverine dropping in from time to time. 
Madripoor, for those who don't know, is a small nation in the mold of Singapore, only grimier and seedier where the criminal class run things. Wolverine was known as Patch there and was an enforcer for an assassin and spy, Yuko, at one time or another. Other Marvel figures float through Madripoor for various reasons, but at its heart it would be a crime drama in that it would be a weird but cool blend of The Sopranos and Casablanca with a dash of Netflix's Daredevil and Punisher. Another series in this vein could be a reboot of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. series ABC ran for seven or eight seasons, and like the original, it would revolve around a top-tier team of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who run around dealing with people and events involving supervillains and criminals the more mundane law enforcement types cannot handle. This might be a way to try and rehabilitate the Inhumans as well. The Inhumans are cool characters that were not done well by Disney Marvel's The Inhumans miniseries. To be blunt, they shit the bed with that one. While the actors chosen for the roles were good enough, the writing was absolute garbage and the effects left a lot to be desired. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. used the Inhumans to much better effect than the actual show called The Inhumans, which is so Disney Marvel. So that makes an opening slate that contains the following movies and shows. A vampire action horror movie that has the possibility to lead into a Blade action horror movie. Both would be rated R with modest budgets. The Blade movie would get made with or without the vampire movie tie-in. Then we have the journey into mystery type movie. For that, we would go traditional and exploratory. Do a Norse movie. Most likely a buddy adventure featuring Thor and Loki going on a journey and encountering giants or trolls or the Jormungandr. Some creature from Norse mythology. For the second movie, I would pick a mythology other than European. My preference would be Japanese because Japan's culture is so interesting and their religious history is rich with fascinating stories. However, Chinese, Indian, African, or Latin American would work just as well. That movie would need an excellent writer who would just do the movie and not use it to propagandize. You would also need to get a mythology expert on the culture to keep the writer on point and as culturally accurate as possible, which means the director would also need to be one whose ego was not so massive as to not allow him or her to take the advice of experts or turn it into a parody of said culture. We also have the detective story to do. I would get Kristen Ritter and simply reboot Jessica Jones from Netflix only as new MCU movies. Such a movie could introduce characters like Daredevil into the mix as well. If recasting is necessary, someone like Lulu Wilson would be interesting casting if we were wanting to go younger. Older actresses like Anya Taylor-Joy would work as well, but fewer movies would be able to be made with them. Similar to that is the spy movie. My preference would be to do something with Wolverine in his guise as Patch, But I would also love to see someone like Mockingbird, Silver Sable, or a proper Domino. Not that nonsense from Deadpool 2. Or a recasted Nick Fury spy flick. Either with his original backstory or with a backstory a little further up in time, depending on who is cast. My preference for the start of Marvel martial arts movies would once again be Wolverine, but you might have noticed I happen to be a Wolverine fan. There was a limited series done by Marvel Comics where Wolverine and Kitty Pride, aka Shadowcat, went to Japan to face off against a demon bothering Wolverine's love, Mariko. That would make an awesome movie or miniseries for D+. Getting away from Wolverine, however, a proper Iron Fist and Power Man movie would be cool. Power Man, by the way, was Luke Cage's hero name. There are other characters in this genre to pick from as well, including but not limited to Elektra, Stick, The Hand, and The Black Knight. Space science fiction movies, I would start with two. The Scroll Nova Core movie and The Brood movie. But the definite one would be the Scroll Nova Core flick. It has the most potential for broad appeal for those who like action and science fiction on a grand scale. 
The Brood movie would be a lower budget and more likely to lose that section of the audience too young for what would have to be an R-rated movie due to the body horror and the violence. The other two movies could wait to gauge the success of the first one or two sci-fi entries into the new expanded MCU. Then we have the X-Men and Fantastic Four movies with a Doctor Doom movie planned following the second Fantastic Four movie, assuming the first one's a success. Which means five films with just the opening X-Men movie and Fantastic Four slash Doctor Doom movie. Again, assuming they are successful. This brings our total to 13 or 14 films. That would take up five years worth of scheduling, give or take, because if you diversify genre types, having multiple Marvel movies doesn't matter as much. The superhero genre was oversaturated because all of the Marvel and DC movies were superhero movies. Everything was a CGI fest with diminishing returns, making moviegoers cotton on to the Marvel formula and begin to tire with bad storytelling. Then we also have the New Mutants, Power Pack, and Exterminator series on Disney+, Plus, along with a pre-Terminators miniseries to show where the original X-Men go after Krakoa and before they rejoin the X-Men. And however many X-Men Origin D-Plus movies the budget will handle. As with the movies, you also diversify the D-plus shows. The Ghost Rider series, the Vampire series, the Mythology Anthology series, the Madripoor series, and a rebooted Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's eight series plus the X-Factor miniseries and however many X-Men Origin miniseries the budget can handle. That slate could also be spaced over the same period as the movies, or you could compress it a little. I would also do a few more animated shows for the younger audience. X-Men 97, which is coming soon to D+, is in that vein. The 1990s was the best era for animated comic book content we have ever seen. The X-Men, Batman, Spider-Man, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and others all came out in that decade and, for the most part, were all fairly well done. A renaissance of that era makes good sense if it is done correctly. The showrunner of the upcoming X-Men series has been saying the right things, but the show has also been plagued with rumors and controversies that hint the activists either have swayed the production or have been trying to. Keep the politics and social engineering out of the shows and just make good, entertaining cartoons for kids. Good subjects for those shows would be the characters that we are letting rest in the live-action side of things. The Avengers and Guardians of the Galaxy immediately come to mind. I would also like to see a She-Hulk animated show done right, not like the abomination of the live-action show that it turned into. A proper New Defenders show could also be very cool, especially if it immediately followed an X-Men movie based on Giant X-Men number 1 since Angel, Iceman, and Beast all joined the Defenders before joining X-Factor and then rejoining the X-Men. And to anyone who saw the Netflix Defender show, no, that was not the real comic book version of the Defenders or the new Defenders. Not even close. Other very cool comic book groups that would make good animated shows would be Alpha Flight, Excalibur, and Squadron Supreme. This allows you to do multiple schedulings each season with different genres, mitigating superhero fatigue on the television front as well. Characters that could not support a full-blown movie would be shunted to D+, and trotted out for cameo or supporting appearances in the movie of the appropriate genre. And this is just the first wave of shows and other D+, content. Each year you can introduce new shows or miniseries. But you have to make sure the writing is not crap, as the shows are now, and the showrunners are not activists or too weak to control the writer's room if they are not the ones doing the writing themselves. How nobody in Disney or Marvel management looked at the dailies of those shows being shot and did not stop them immediately is beyond me. 
That is how to make absolutely positive your streaming platform goes to hell in a handcart and you hemorrhage money. Oh, and as I said before, always keep in mind that comic book characters rarely age, but Hollywood actors do. Prepare to recast even the most popular roles or actors at least every 8 to 10 years. Maybe as long as 12 to 15 if the role was cast fairly young at the start of the actor's run. And no actor, no matter how beloved, is indispensable. If one dies, like the late and missed Chadwick Boseman, recast them. They were not the character. They were a actor playing the character. Pay all reverence to the dearly departed, of course, and then move on with life. I would also like to add my two cents on the Star Wars front, but that is a different video. One that I probably won't even make as long as Kathleen Kennedy is still in charge on the infinitesimal chance that someone over at Lucasfilm is still interested in making actual Star Wars and uses my idea to allow that menace to creativity to keep her grasp on Lucasfilm. That scenario is massively doubtful. But why chance it? Even Disney will eventually get tired of pouring money into Kathleen Kennedy's personal power trip money trap. That would be all of my phase one of a rebooted, reimagined MCU. And that is all I would plan until the last couple of films were in production. The idea that Disney Marvel is planning a half a decade or more in advance with the MCU is imbecilic. This is the movie business. You need to plan based on what the audience decides to pay you for, not what you want to produce. That sort of thing is fine for low-budget independent films or art films. The MCU is playing with budgets in the hundreds of millions of dollars. You flop with that kind of money on the table and you find yourself in the mess that Disney and Warner Brothers and Paramount are in. They should not be making movies with those kinds of budgets and be fine with earning a few tens of millions in return. If that. No. $200 million budgets are the kinds of projects you expect to break a billion. Which is why Doctor Strange 2 and Thor 4 were considered disappointments, even though they made a bit of money. Both should have broken a billion given their budgets and the past performance of the franchise. Bad writing, terrible directing by Taika Waititi, assigning audiences homework, turning your films into parodies of themselves, and injecting ideology stifled what were, in the end, bad movies. And planning for more of the same a half a decade down the road is not how multi-hundred billion dollar studios stay in business. No. Once your slate for phase one is up and running, then you can start spitballing ideas for phase two and introducing new characters. But never more than two or three movies a year in a single genre. And never more than two a summer. When you have the last picture or two in production, and the phase is a success, then you can start planning the next phase, including continuing those character lines you have established. If a movie hits big, immediately greenlight a sequel by all means, but don't rush it. Absence makes the heart grow fonder and the fans more rabid. There is a reason Star Wars fans are considered a little crazy. And it is because George Lucas used to make us wait for him. And Disney paid him $4 billion for his IPs. Oh, and only once every other phase or so are you allowed to create a world-ending event. Keep the stakes small at first. And build to your alien invasion. Or your Galactus. Or your Fall of the Mutants. Or your Infinity War. And don't forget... Your D-plus shows can also have events like that, but keep them smaller. Only do crossover events with your D-plus shows every couple few seasons. And with it all, advertise the bloody comic books. The American comic industry used to be a billion dollar industry. Minus the Japanese manga, it no longer is. 
and advertise your shows and movies in the books and advertise the comics in the shows and movies prominently. Expand the genre portfolio of the MCU. Bring in the new characters Disney has bought. Rest the characters they have worn out with the current MCU. And fire all of the writers and directors that have been doing such a bad job instead of promoting them and you will go a long way to fixing what ails Disney Marvel. This is a mess created by poor management and ideological verve to propagandize through entertainment without actually being entertaining. Oversaturation and formulaic stories have not helped anything. And everyone in Hollywood needs to face the fact that they have mightily screwed the pooch with that and streaming. The lockdowns and the streaming wars got people comfortable with the idea of getting quality entertainment at home. You need to reteach the audience why they used to love to go to the movies and see muscle-bound guys and sleekly athletic ladies kicking ass and saving the world. Show them that you understand your activists f***ed up in thinking the audience was the problem when the audience was the audience, the target of the production. Show them that you understand that you don't make movies for the shill media or the 13 weirdos on Twitter screeching over this or that political talking point everybody is supposed to care about, but nobody but they actually do. Show them that entertainment and making money from that entertainment is once again the primary concern of the studio, not using the entertainment as a platform for indoctrination and social engineering. And when marketing your movies, shows, and comics, tell your people to shut the f*** up about their personal, political, and social issues. Put it in their contracts, because those arrogant sh** for brains will do it if there is not monetary consequences for them destroying their own projects. Nothing has tanked Hollywood productions more than actors, writers, directors, and producers coming out and pumping the media full of how their project is full of the message. Even when it isn't. If you can keep them off social media too, that would be even better. This is not hard. This is the comic book movie. Good versus evil. Superheroes versus supervillains. The good guys save the world and the bad guys get what they deserve. If you keep in mind it is a guy-centric medium and stop trying to drive them away in order to lure in a new audience that doesn't exist, it is a money printing press. And as long as you are producing just enough or a little less than demand asks for and at the quality they expect, the superhero genre will be healthy. If not, it will be in the state it is in right now. The hilarious thing is that DC has almost entirely missed out on the comic book movie boom since they could never get out of their character's way as they bumbled and stumbled about creating their own cinematic universe. And it may be too late. But that is a topic for a different video. This is my vision for a rescued Marvel Cinematic Universe. Let me know what you think about my vision and that is all I have for this video. If you like what I do here, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when new videos are uploaded. Also, please hit the like button, share the video, and leave your thoughts on my proposed rescue plan down below. It is all appreciated and it helps the channel. The link to my Disney Marvel is Dying video is in the description, as is the link to Razorfist's uh, Western video. Until next time. Shoes.